Martin. I'm uh, one of the guides that will be uh, accompanying you on the visit today. Andres, uh, I will stay upstairs with you and talk about CMS today. Yeah, so in a few minutes, we'll actually go downstairs and see the big detector that you've started learning about already, it seems. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's a great time to do this visit uh, because the detector is still accessible, as you may already know. Uh, we're expected to restart collisions later this year. But for now, we can go in and uh, show you around. Uh... Exactly. And at the moment, just so you have an idea of where we are, we're coming to you from the control room of CMS. So this is where we do a lot of operations. Behind us are sitting some of the shifters for the, that we have a series of shifters that are here all year long. Um, well, except for the, the holiday break that we have. Yeah. But especially when we start ramping up the beams, which will happen in the, in the next month, we'll slowly start ramping everything up. Uh, we have a very active control room where everyone will be uh, running around, taking measurements, uh, making sure that our detector operates well when we have the proton collisions. Um, so I don't know how we want to get started because we can show them the control room in a bit of detail with the camera, um, or we could talk about, you know, we could show them the map and show the area. I don't know if you saw the Alps today, but they look really magnificent today. Okay. So it's uh, it's just the sun is almost about to set, and it's a very, very nice view. Yeah. Um, and maybe we can show them the, the map really quick. Just yeah, so yeah just, a... just quickly, since they have already seen something okay. in the talks, uh, previous talks. But yeah, I let you to talk. I mean, well, I mean, here, here you have a view like this. This is, uh, I guess, a picture if you were sitting uh, on the Jura Mountains, at the top of the Jura Mountains, and you're looking out at, at the distance at the Alps. And then CMS is just on the left here. And you can see the the dotted line is the uh, the Swiss French border. So we, uh, yeah, most of the people are, of course, living in the Switzer France area. So we're crossing the border pretty much every day. Uh, yeah, so CMS is a bit far away. Uh, the city of Geneva is just in the background. So uh, from Geneva, you could take the tram, and you're already in Atlas. Um, so yeah, I don't know if there, you want to add anything about Geneva. Yeah, I mean, I think the one thing I'd like to just say is one of the cool things about the history of Geneva is not just CERN, it's also the UN. We have a lot of a, a giant international group here. It's not just CERN and you have people from all over the world. And I think the thing I like the most is just every day. I mean, I, I can't even count how many languages I've heard just today. Yeah, uh, it's, it's crazy. I mean, for example, Zoltan, how many languages do you speak? Too many. Yeah. Not too many. Of course, the Hungarian, yeah, the easiest language. I was very young when I learned it. <laughs> uh, something in English, probably, or surely not correctly. I understand some words in, in French and Russian. And I've heard you say a little bit of Italian before. <laughs> oh, well, uh, something, well, uh, definitely not speaking, that is something to understand. Uh, this is probably the, the worst because I can equally probability misunderstand <laughs> sentences. <laughs> Great. No, okay. Yeah, but, uh, yeah, there's a lot of it, it. It's very, very international. I've definitely been in the control room at times where everyone except for me is Italian and speaking Italian. I've also been here in times when everyone is speaking French. And yeah. then I was like, oh, okay, yeah. let me try to keep up in the TC meeting when it's all in French. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so uh, I think maybe we can sort of get started and maybe you could start, you could yeah. show the control mode if you prefer, or we could do that when you come back, um, it's up to you. I think, I think what deserves the most attention is the CMS detector itself. We yeah. start taking them downstairs and then we can give them a nice view of how we actually operate it when we come back up. Make cool. sure that we devote as much time as we can to showing the, the, the hey, previous folks. experiment of the LHC. Hey. hey, hey, can you hear me? Yes. Seems like we're having a problem with video. Um, some of the students can't see you guys. I can see um, the post. Yeah. Maybe has it been spotlighted? Can everybody see now? So they should select the speaker view. Yeah, that's what I figured. Um, so see if you can find CMS control room and right click. 
the spotlight has been put on the control room. I've also pinned it or somebody's pinned it. You should be able to see everything now. So please speak up if you can't see it and uh, control room, please continue. Okay. Maybe this is also a good time to say uh, we have a Q and A. Yeah, uh, they already use it. Okay. They already oh, use it. So you know all about it. Yeah, they are Fantastic. back. And yeah, maybe before we get started, uh, it sounds like there's already been some talks. Uh, so I, I don't, I would, I will try not to have too much overlap. But it, it's unclear if, if do they know already about the LHC and CMS? They yes, yes, definitely. Yes, definitely. You can you can recap the, the things, but I I would recommend to go around with the mobile camera. Okay. Uh, and and show. Okay. Don't worry. <laughs> okay. So yeah, Fran is gonna get geared up, and uh, we'll get on our way. Yep. Okay. Um. So all right. Since you have you guys have heard uh, already a bit about. DLHC and CERN and CMS. Uh, maybe I could uh, say just very briefly, Brandon mentioned the history of Geneva and CERN in particular. And one thing that's not uh, not necessarily obvious to perhaps you guys, or I don't know if you know any about the, any of this, but CERN was founded in the 50s. And to this day, we're still using one of the detectors that was built around that time. So um, hopefully you can see my mouse pointer, but if you look at this uh, sort of pink circle over here, so that's the proton synchrotron, and I'm not sure that you can see there's a year, it's 1959. So this is around the time that this detector, this uh, accelerator was commissioned. And at the time it was the most powerful proton synchrotron at the time, and that's just, just the name, proton synchrotron. So a lot of important research was done uh, around that time. And then years later, a bigger detector was proposed. Uh, it, it's got some more history, but to, to make it very, very simplistic, they just made a bigger accelerator, uh, added a super at the beginning, and it's the super proton synchrotron. Uh, so that's a very, very, uh, no, a very simple view, right? A lot of things happened in between, um, but the SPS actually, you know, that's where a Nobel Prize was won, a Nobel Prize in Physics uh, by Carlo Rubia and Simon van der Meer. Um, so the, partly for their work in discovering the new vector bosons, uh, this was around the 70s. Uh, and after that, again, again, years later, a bigger accelerator was proposed, but what you may or may not know is that the LHC was first, uh, the LHC tunnel was first used for the, um, for an electron positron collider. So this is the large electron positron collider as we know it and it operated uh, around the 90s and 2000s. And in, you know, this is just sort of the CERN history, right? But there's been other accelerators, the Tevatron at Fermilab to name one, uh, and meant, you know, around the world as well. So there's a lot of history at CERN, a lot of, and, and part of what I wanted to emphasize is that to this day, we're using these accelerators that were commissioned many, many decades ago and are really part of history. So maybe we can check with Brandon. And they see they just turned on. Okay. Yeah, hello, can you hear me? Yes. yes, sir. Amazing. Okay, so I didn't want to interrupt you too much, Andreas, but I just wanted to say we're getting ready to go downstairs, and we thought it would be interesting to show you the process, because we actually, what we're going to do is we have an iris scanner, so it's actually going to scan my eyes to make sure it confirms my identity. So I give my badge, this is my dosimeter, it measures if I get any uh, dose of radiation while I'm downstairs. And then as Naomi is showing, I'm looking into a screen right now that's scanning my eyes. And now it's confirmed my identity. So it's actually fun because normally on a visit, I'm showing everyone how this works, uh, but you actually get to come through the everything with me. So you get to see what it's like and I get to talk to you. Now, Naomi can actually show you because she's holding the camera, what the iris scanner looks like. She's going to position it so that it reads her eyes. And then she's going to enter through our gate. So it's kind of fun. Hey, so there's a, yeah. there's a fun trivia that we like to mention. Uh, so there's a movie from a, a couple of years ago now called Angels and Demons, and it takes place at CERN. 
it's a Dan Brown novel, if I recall correctly. And uh, in not not to you know spoil the the plot, right? But it, the plot involves CERN, and there's a theft uh, at CERN, and somebody steals some stuff. And the way they do this, some is, stuff. Well, so anti stuff. And, and anti yeah, exactly, stuff actually. Exactly. <laughs> but yeah, we don't want to spoil the plot. <laughs> but uh, in any case, they they basically it's a bit gruesome, but they take somebody's eye out and they use it to scan uh, into the into the eye, uh, iris scanner uh, and sultan is a very uh, he likes to point out that this wouldn't happen this this wouldn't work anymore because we've upgraded the systems and it actually checks for blood flow so you can't just take somebody's eye and, and scan it <laughs> anyway back to brandon <laughs> I mean, it's always crazy to me when you're doing these iris scans because it feels like you're something out of James Bond or something or, or, or Mission Impossible or some sort of spy movie. You walk into a special room, but then it's, it's not. It's a, I mean, I think it's a great safety feature that we have and we can always check the security, but then we can always show people uh, the experiment itself. So now I'm actually going to enter into the elevator. Uh, Naomi and I, she has the camera. Uh, we're going to go downstairs. So we're going 100 meters under us to show you the experiment. When I enter into the elevator, we won't have signal anymore. So we'll lose you guys for just a little bit. Um, and then we'll reconnect and actually start showing you the experiment. So I think from this moment on, I'll let the Andreas take it away <laughs> for a few minutes. Okay. So uh, yeah, I'm, maybe I could just say a quick word about why we're going underground. We right? well. So uh, most of the CERN facilities and the LHC facilities in particular are all deep underground. And there's a couple of reasons why. Uh, I, I typically try to ask people to think of why all the experiments are underground. And one of the answers you get, and something I thought was the, one of the big reasons is to shield from cosmic rays, right? So we always get cosmic rays coming from outer space and they certainly, uh, you know, it, there are more of them at the surface. However, at the depth that CMS is 100 meters from the ground, we still see plenty of cosmic rays. So when you have cosmic rays, very often you produce muons and muons are like heavy electrons. So it's very difficult to, to change their momentum. And they just puncture through the earth. Uh, a lot of the time. So we can see them at CMS. Uh, so, you know, yes, we, we get fewer cosmic rays, but it's not really the reason we're so deep underground. One important reason is that this is where the bedrock is, right? So uh, the, the bedrock in the Geneva area is, you know, from 50 to 150 meters deep, which is another interesting point is that in this picture, you see the, the LHC ring uh, seems to be parallel to the surface, but in, in actuality, it's tilted. Um, and in fact, it's tilted towards the Jura. So it's, it's up to 150 meters deep in some places. And it's as, um, you know, as close to 50 meters to the surface in other points. Andreas, and, I'm, I think uh, you're giving a great description of the LHC, but I wanna go ahead and interrupt you so that we can uh, show some more things. Is that okay? Go ahead, yes. Excellent. So now we are 100 meters underground. And actually in front of us, what you're gonna look at now is you can actually see the shaft that goes hundred meters up. So you, there's some stairs that can be used for any maintenance access that might need to be done. Uh, it's actually kind of a cool fact. We just came out of an elevator shaft. For us, this elevator shaft is pressurized, meaning that if there was ever some sort of emergency in the cavern or at the LHC and we needed to go upstairs quickly, the safest place is to enter into the elevator. We know that we can we can enter in here. There's a, a, a wave of pressure that you'll feel as you enter into the doors here, and then you actually take the elevator and go up, up, up to the surface. So in an emergency, often I think people are think of, oh, never take the elevator, but here, rule number one is okay, take the, not rule number one, but one of the primary rules is take the elevator. <laughs> um, and if you, I don't know if you guys saw it, but there's this nice art installation we have it's to sort of, it shows these streams of light going up to the surface. Now, everything that we do when we take data uh, relates, it ends up going down to, to ones and zeros. And, and, and like, if you think of just computer code and we transmit information across large distances by sending optical signals on fiber optics. And this is kind of a nice visualization of, oh, you know, think just a, uh, an artist's representation of what the data looks like as we're sending it to the surface. 
Now, in the next moment here, we're going to enter into what we call a counting room. Here we have different computers that service our detector. Some of these are for uh, what we call our detector control systems. They allow us to turn on different sections of CMS. So some of the detectors at CMS operate at high voltages. I think pretty much all of them. I don't know any that operate only at low voltages, but I'm not sure. So, <laughs> but uh, we, I'll show you an example for the detector I work on. I work on a gaseous detector called the GEM detectors. So this stands for gas electron multiplier. They consist of a gas volume and we actually turn on the individual foils with high voltage so that we can create this uh, nice electric field. And as a particle travels through it, it creates a stream of ions and electrons. And then the ions and electrons will drift. The electrons uh, collect and induce a signal that we're able to read out. But it all starts, the magic all starts in this room here where we're actually controlling the detectors. And starting, this is also the very first place that we're starting to receive data. There are some amounts of analysis and quick calculations we can do before sending it to the surface. So here we have what we call our detective safety systems to make sure that if there's any sort of high pressure, unexpected uh, magnetic field or unexpected thing in the detector, we can safely ramp down, identify the problem as quick as possible and keep CMS safe because we've invested a lot of money. Um, so as we continue through here, and this we're taking a look at our, what we call our trigger and DAC systems. So DAC stands for data acquisition. And this is actually where we start taking all of the data from the CMS experiments. Now, uh, continuing on, we're gonna start looking at some of our detector control system. I'll actually show you mine right here. So if you come in, these are the high voltage supplies for the gem detectors. So we have these fancy cables that actually connect to each individual detector. And when we power on, we're able to put a high voltage inside of our detector to make this detection of particles possible. Now, I think Grace earlier and the other talks that I was sort of taking a look at gave you a nice overview of how does a tracker work? How does the gaseous detector work? How does a calorimeter work? And here we're dealing with gaseous detectors. Uh, so this is a kind of a nice thing to, to take a look at. Now, in the next minutes, let's go ahead and start actually heading toward the experiment. Uh, but while we head toward the experiment, so we first we go down these stairs. And if we take a look in front of us, we have an access tunnel that goes straight to the LHC. Now, normally we don't go to the LHC because the tunnels are more confined and we have magnets with liquid helium that are running through them. So if there's ever a leak and the gas expands through the tunnel, it, it creates a hazard. So if you enter in the LHC tunnel, you need to carry one of these safety packs. So actually you have a pack as down here that you can open up and have this rescue mask. This is in case of a, a, a leak of a gas or a fire or something like this in these small tunnels. Now, as we had, the experimental cavern is very large. So inside of the CMS cavern, we don't actually have to worry about uh, the room filling up with a gas too fast that we're not able to access safety equipment. We have uh, cabinets just like this in case of an emergency. And we're also able to go to the elevators that can take us to the surface. So, but if we were to think of what is actually behind this door going to the LHC, we have a nice fun picture that we always like to show. So often at, uh, when you're at CMS, uh, we'll have a nice pause and everyone can take pictures here. And then behind on the other side uh, is a nice place to kind of get some statistics about the LHC. Now, one of the things that I always uh, want, to, we always look at the sort of the, the speed at the protons at different stages of the LHC in terms of percentage of the speed of light. Now, once we enter in the LHC, you see how close to the speed of light we are. We'll never actually achieve that because protons have mass. They're not these massless particles like photons, but the closer and closer and closer we want to get to the speed of light, the more energy we have to put in. So now you see that the protons have seven TeV of energy. You have the beams going in opposite directions. So when you have a collision, both having seven TeV of energy, 
that's when you actually create then your 13 TV collisions or your 14 TV collisions. So Brendan, uh, can I quickly interrupt for a, uh, just, just absolutely. For, for trivia, you can see that the protons when they're going at 7 TV uh, seven corresponds to very, very close to the speed of light. But one, another way to look at this is that you, uh, the speed of light in vacuum is uh, 299,792,458 meters per second. Wow. And uh, <laughs> if you subtract three from that, that is the speed of the protons in the ring. Uh, and maybe we can very quickly just to show uh, part of what Brandon was saying about the tunnel, mm -hmm. uh, we'll share just very quickly just a, a schematic. Little, of, a yeah. yes. yep. uh, so this right. is a schematic of uh, a top view. And here, if you can see my mouse, this is the elevator that Brandon uh, came out of. He, then he turned left, went through the racks and he's at this corner uh, or this corner is where that door that Brandon is showing is. So this door, you can see that leads to the LHC uh, and the LHC uh, itself, the LHC ring is a straight line in, at this point, right? It just looks like a straight, it's a straight section actually. And uh, Brandon is now gonna walk towards the pilier and the, the pilier is a seven meter thick reinforced concrete wall. So as you, you're gonna see that he's gonna come out to this corner There's a, and he's doing that right now. And he's gonna uh, find this yellow booth that's similar to the one we had at the surface, but this one is interlocked and this would stop the LHC if it's running if somebody tries to go through it without the proper permissions and so on. And once you go through, he will have to go around the pilier and you, you will be able to see Brandon walking around the seven meter concrete thick wall. So maybe with that, we can hand it over back to you, Brandon. Well, at the moment, I'm again, again going through the, um, through the iris scanner. So if you want to discuss a little bit more, I'll let you do that while we enter into the cavern. I think this is a good opportunity for a few more details, Andreas. Sure. So uh, as I mentioned, this door is interlocked, but uh, very often when we have a sort of a quick access, there are also these keys that you would need to get, right? So uh, what you scan your, your dosimeter and it does scan your in this uh, compartment. Yeah. So yeah, and on, inside of those compartments, there are these interlock keys. And while they're missing, if somebody has one of those keys, the LEC does not work. It cannot physically work. Uh, so the, if you're working inside of the detector and you take one of those keys, you really don't want to lose it because uh, otherwise the LEC won't work. <laughs> okay, so now, as right as Brandon turns left, if you start counting, this, this wall on your left is solid concrete all the way across our detector. This whole wall is- Concrete like, and iron. And iron, yeah, it's reinforced concrete. Uh, so yeah, maybe we can hand it back. Excellent. So now we're gonna enter inside of the CMS cavern. So it is a little bit noisy. We constantly have different things flowing in the CMS uh, experimental cavern. So some of the noise you hear can relate to the cooling that we have of our electronics. Uh, some of no, the we have a very good we have a very good noise cancelling microphone. They don't hear any noise. Wow, excellent. <laughs> well, I can tell you that in this moment uh, in the CMS cavern, it is quite noisy, <laughs> and normally you hear these sort of whistling sounds of the um, of the different gas mixtures going into the chamber, like different gaseous detectors we have on the outer sections of CMS and so even all the different pumps that relate to the cooling. So we have several different types of cooling at CMS. I always find this interesting. So we have these cooling systems for our electronics of our front end electronics, the electronics that allow us to communicate with the detector. Uh, in our gaseous detectors, we use water cooling and, and same for our calorimeters. We have these nice water cooling systems. We don't put the water directly on the electronics, otherwise that would damage it. So actually we take the water to a, often to a copper circuit. And this copper circuit is connected to the electronics so that as the water flows through, it cools the copper, cooling the electronics, keeping everything at an operational temperature. Now, the very inner part of the CMS detector is actually a silicon de detector. This is the tracking system. And silicon has to be cooled using carbon dioxide. It's very small sensors that we're dealing with in this innermost region. And we're actually keeping these cool with a special CO2 cooling system, which I always find fascinating. Now, now we're actually taking a look at the CMS experiment. We're standing at one end cap. At this moment, the side of the CMS is closed. So it's in this closed configuration. This big red 
uh, shield that you're seeing is actually a shielding that we have to prevent what we call particle backscattering. So after we have a proton collision, the particles can travel to the ends of the halls, end of the experimental cavern, and they can actually travel backwards through the detector. The way we try to prevent this is by having these nice absorbers at the very end to try to prevent particles from going backwards through our detector so that we can very precisely uh, try to only collect particles that originated in the collision as they travel outwards. Now, what you're also seeing here is the actual beam pipe of the LHC. So the, yeah, as Naomi's finger is, you can follow it. This is the beam pipe to the LHC, which is under vacuum. And uh, as we, over the next month, we're gonna start cooling and making sure that this vacuum is, is ready to handle all of the protons that are about to go through it. Now, um, I think always something that I find on visits that everyone forgets is we're not just putting one single proton against another proton. We have giant packets of protons, what we call bunches, and we push them into uh, very tight bunches and we try to have the collisions and then we have them collide with each other. Now in these individual collisions, you might have protons that hit each other directly or ones that sort of scatter off of each other and they can go, and the ones that go scattering off of each other go in these more, these regions very close to the beam line that you follow. Whereas the ones that hit each other directly, they start to go more through our detector. And we're, that's the particles that we want to observe, that we want to study. Now you can see a number of different racks that we have on the outsides of the experiment. These racks are also for letting us start to collect the data. Uh, they're for continuing to operate the electronics for operating the high voltage and the low voltage. Uh, and actually this is kind of a fun part of the virtual visit. If I was, if you were here today with me at CMS, I would have to stop right at this gate and we wouldn't be able to go any further. I would just show you that view, but because you're on a virtual visit today, we get to walk around the CMS experiment and see it more in detail. And we get to see a much more interesting part because the other side of the experiment is a bit more open at the moment. Hey, Brendan, sorry yes. to interrupt, but as you're walking, I'm sure everybody has heard how CMS is made into a dozen or so slices. Maybe you can show them what one of these slices look like. It's like in between these green bars, right? Exactly. So this is one of the wheels that we're looking, one of these wheels that we're looking at that come together to make what we call the barrel region of CMS. And so we, we, that's why we have this sort of B here. It tells us that this is a, one of the wheels that's on top of what we call the barrel region where the collisions are happening. And at the very end of the experiment, we wanna track all the particles that go through. On the two sides, we have what are called the end cap disc. And uh, so is this structure that Andreas was pointing out, each one of these racks, each one of these sort of green pylons are these movable wheels. So when we actually need to do maintenance on the detector, we have a, a big team that comes through and can move the wheels and the discs in and out so we can access different parts. Maybe but not we by need hand. To make, <laughs> but not by hand. <laughs> actually, it's a fascinating hydraulic system that we use. And I don't know if you have any examples or anything you can show uh, Andreas or Zoltan, but I think it's a, I mean, it's amazing oh. the process of, of moving the disc. Well, you can probably go to the ground floor and show them the feet and the winch that is used for that. Good point. And that's what we'll do. But this, to me, is one of the most exciting parts because now we get to see the open portion of CMS. So I'll stand here for a couple of seconds and we'll return to the disk that we move in and out. But this is one of the disks that's expanded out so we can access different detectors at the moment. And this is what we call the end cap. So if you take a close look at the, the, where the beam line goes. Inside in this region here, this is where our calorimeters are. You can't actually see where the tracker is, but very up in the center is where the tracker is. It's a small area compared to how large the experiment actually is. Uh, but it's one of the most precise, one of the most expensive components of the experiment. Then we have our calorimeters for measuring energy that you can see now are all wrapped in foil. Then we have the magnet. So this is our big superconducting solenoid that gives us the strong magnetic field. 
that allows us that allows the charged particles to actually curve as they travel through. And this allows us to reconstruct the momentum of the particles, allows us to identify their charge and help us better determine what kind of particle are we actually looking at. So Brendan, now, maybe I can take a very, very quick second. Uh, we're showing sure. right now uh, sort of a view of CMS when it's closed. So I just want to put the pieces together here. And one of the things that uh, you can very easily point out from your image is the edge of the superconducting magnet. So in yeah. uh, in what you see right now where Brandon is, you can see the edge of this cylind uh, cylinder of this magnet. It's six meters in inner diameter. And on the picture that we're showing, it corresponds to this blue, uh, this, gray. Th this gray or, or sorry, uh, uh, white, uh, let's say, cylinder. And you could just see the edges of it. And inside, as Brandon was saying, we have all or pretty much all the calorimetry and all the tracking. So this is a, a unique feature of the CMS detector is that all, pretty much all of our calorimetry, there's a small asterisk, but, uh, and all our tracking is inside of the magnet. The rest of the system, the rest of the detector is dedicated to muon measurement. Okay, back to Brandon. All right, thank you, Andreas. So now if we actually take a look at what we call, we're gonna look at what we call the nose. This piece is going to be inserted into the disc and this nose consists of the what we call the sort of end cap region. It's the very first part that deals with very high rates of particles. Now, remember, as I told you, when you have a proton collision, often you get sort of glancing blows. And with these glancing blows, you have particles that will come through the nose more frequently than, for example, through the barrel region. So we always put specialized detectors in this region. So the, we call it the nose just because it sticks out and resembles a nose, <laughs> but it fits in actually like a puzzle piece. So soon the, this will be moved into this closed configuration. Now the detectors that I work on, these gaseous detectors, they're actually on the very edge of this nose here. They're now covered in foils, so you can't actually see them. Uh, but this is one of our muon detectors. And if you take a closer look over here to the left, we have another type of muon detector called a cathode strip chamber. So these cathode strip chambers, these are a more traditional technology. They work with a pattern of strips that, uh, and wires that sort of crisscross, and you can make a grid. So as an ionizing particle travels through, and in the electric field, we can collect on those strips and wires, ions and electrons, to identify the path that the particle took as it travels through these detectors. Now the one I work on is a little bit more, is a, is, a, is a newer detector that can actually handle these higher rates that we're about to get in our new upgrade of the LHC. So in a few more years, we're gonna shut down, have an even higher, um, what we call luminosity, more particle, uh, we'll essentially have more particle rates. So as the particles collide, we expect lots more uh, to travel through our detectors. And we need to be able to compensate for this. We need to make sure that our, our technology can handle all the particles going through. I mean, I think when you think about it, we have a proton collision every 25 nanoseconds. So that ends up being, uh, that's what, 40 megahertz? So then we end up having 40 million collisions every second. And then you have to go through make sure that you're sensitive to the particles in these collisions as you start to say, okay, I wanna keep some data, I don't wanna keep others. But I think sometimes you'll hear people say the analogy that the CMS experiment is like a camera. It's so much more than a camera. It's, I mean, you're actually taking tracks, you're starting to make, as you connect the dots and uh, measure the path of the particles, you're also measuring their energy. You're taking uh, these, you're taking measurements every 25 nanoseconds. That's incredible. I mean, that's, uh, to me, I always get amazed. I'm down here and I think about how fast we have to do everything. So, so Brendan, maybe I could uh, just add a few words if you don't mind. Uh, absolutely, so, and we'll go down while you do that. <laughs> okay, great. So um, you, you got a, a couple of points that uh, deserve a bit more detail, I think. So the trigger system you mentioned, it's a way to, for us to filter the data. So we have 40 million collisions per second, right? Uh, 
roughly speaking. I mean, that's as often as 40 million times per second. And each time, if you want to record the information in that event, as we call it, it's about the size of a photo. It's a couple of megabytes. So you simply cannot store everything, right? You have to throw away some of the data that you don't find as interesting. You only keep the events that are very interesting. Uh, so that's the triggering system. We can talk about it a bit more. But I also, uh, Brandon was talking about the upgrade and what we call the high luminosity LHC. Uh, Brandon already said that when we actually have a collision, it's something like 100 billion protons colliding with 100 billion protons, and we squeeze them to about the width of a human hair. And when that happens, we see about 30, 40, or maybe 50 of them interacting every time on average. Uh, but when we go to this high luminosity LHC, we're going to see a many, many more collisions. We're talking 100, 150, maybe 200 of them interacting. Uh, so that means that we need to rebuild and install new detector technologies. And uh, Brandon mentioned the GEMS are one of the, the projects that we've installed now as prototypes, but it's going to be part of the upgrade. Uh, and that entire calorimeter nose will need to be replaced. Um, and, and there's also the tiny little things. We talked about the beam pipe. The beam pipe was recently replaced entirely with a smaller diameter one, because in a few years, we're going to replace the, all of the whole tracking system, which is a big, big project. And the tracker is going to be so close to the interactions that we need a smaller diameter beam pipe to be installed now in preparation for when we get this very, uh, this, this brand new tracking system uh, for the high luminosity. let's see. So uh, back, back to you, Brandon. Excellent. So what we actually wanted to show just really quickly, because it's quite fun, we create such a strong magnetic field with our a magnet. Now we're actually down we're down at the bottom taking a look at it. We create such a strong magnetic field that after operation, even now where we've been shut down, the magnet's not on at the moment, we still have a residual magnetic field in the cavern. And if you want to at different places. So for example, if we take a look at the feet of the end cap, and we very carefully try to place some magnetic, some, some paper clips, you can actually see the directions of the magnetic field. Now, as the magnet cools in a, in a few weeks, we will begin to ramp this magnetic field up and it'll be, just, it'll be much stronger. So I don't know how interactive this is, but uh, does anyone remember the magnetic field strength? I, oh, I guess uh, it's not super interactive. So uh, it's 3.8 Tesla. <laughs> yeah, so the, the magnet actually produces this much. It, this is something like 200,000 times greater than the Earth's magnetic field. But of course, to accomplish this, this is a superconducting magnet. So we need to cool it down to four and a half Kelvin and then inject 18,000 amperes of current to achieve this. And it's, it's also remarkable that, you know, if you think of the dimensions of GMS and you compare them to Atlas and some of the numbers, right? So we generate about twice as much as the magnetic field, but we're about twice as heavy. Right. And then we're also about half the size and th all these things, when you put them together, really make sense. And it, it, the, the name itself, compact muon solenoid, gives you a hint. Right. Uh, so compact, it's very compact with respect to Atlas. It's about half the size, but it's because we produce such a strong magnetic field that even very ener energetic particles, charged energetic particles will still bend significantly within the volume of our detector. Uh, whereas an Atlas, you have to you have a. Uh, you know, half as much magnetic field. So you need to let the particles fly a longer distance so they curve enough for you to figure out what's going on. Uh, and that's also, in, in terms of weight, it means that in CMS, we have a lot of steel. We have 12,500 tons of steel, and that's part of the return yoke. It's part of also the, the muon system. Uh, and we have all that in order to generate two Tesla outside of the magnet of the, of the uh, superconducting solenoid. So there's still a lot of steel. Uh, we always like to refer to CMS being about twice as heavy as the Eiffel Tower, whereas Atlas is only uh, basically roughly as heavy as the Eiffel Tower. Yeah. All okay. the red yeah. stuff you see there is, is steel. Yeah, anytime you see red, uh, it's usually steel, yeah. So you can actually see some of the steel that we're talking about that make up this return yoke. That stabilizes the magnetic field for us. It keeps it closer to the, actual, to the solenoid itself. And as charged particles travel through the exterior, we have this nice magnetic field for them to curve in. Now, something I'd like to point out at the moment uh, is if you start to take a look, these silver things that you're looking at here, 
They're part of the muon system. They're called drift tubes. And I wanted to, again, highlight how much of an international collaboration we really are. So if you take a look at this uh, drift tube up here, this is made by one of the Italian institutes. You can see the ENFN logo actually on the chamber. And if we continue to go up further, we have uh, RWTH Aachen, which is one of the German institutes. And all of us are working together on this project. So you really see parts of the experiments weren't just, it, it's not all assembled at CERN and built all at CERN and done by CERN. I mean, we have parts that are built in the US. One of the professors I know actually flew on an airplane and in the seat next to him on the airplane, he took one of the pixel detectors that is now installed. So he had to buy a seat on the airplane for the pixel detector, which cost several million dollars. <laughs> and it was sort of a, it's, this is the kind of thing that we're actually, that, that we're doing. We're, we're all contributing to this experiment. Now, the other thing I wanted to highlight was we were talking about this very uh, nice closure system. So here, what we're in, I take a look at this foot, this is a hydraulic foot that will, uh, actually, I can't quite remember, Zoltan and uh, Andreas, how is it that the hydraulic foot gives us that pressure that we can use to move the wheel? This is pneumatic. This is pneumatic. We press ah, air sorry. inside. Sorry. Uh, if it was Thank if it you. was water, that would have been, uh, I think, uh, much more unpleasant. So Absolutely. this is air, and we, we use, as far as I know, we use... Uh, something like 100 atmosphere that we press into these feet and that that makes the the whole stuff floating by a couple of millimeters that is enough to reduce the uh, the friction significantly uh, the 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 piece that this uh, foot uh, elevates up together with its i think uh, five or six companion is more than 1,000 tons. Yes, yes, you can see actually these cables that are just at Brandon's feet. So these are tightened up and we very, very carefully and gradually can move the slices. And as Sultan was saying, some of the slices are less heavy, but still that, that means like 100, 200, 300 tons. But the heaviest uh, is could be something like 2,000 tons. Uh, we don't really move the center slice and it's, it is that heavy because it, it includes the magnet. So the magnet is part of the middle slice, what we call YD0, and it's really, really heavy. Something that I, I'm sure was pointed out before, we had to crane each of these slices down. They were assembled at the surface. And then it, it was a very, very difficult process, uh, delicate process, if you will, to lower each one because the, the shaft was very expensive to, to dig. So it was only made as large as it possibly could be to still fit uh, each of the slices. And the, the clearance was something like five centimeters on each, on each side. So it was a very lengthy process to do that. Yeah. So Brandon's walking over to the minus side. Uh, and, oh, you can see the HF garage is open. Uh, and you can yeah. actually see HF is now uh, just it's at out. the floor yeah. of the detector. So it still has to be raised up to yep. its, and this is the hadronic forward. This is one of those asterisks. It's, it's part of the calorimeters. Uh, it, you can argue, it, it's part of the calorimeter system and it's, it's outside the magnet, but um, yeah, most of the tracking and calorimetry happen inside of our, our mm -hmm. superconducting solenoid. As I mentioned before, we always have these sort of, uh, these glancing blows that happen with the protons. I mean, this is in every single time the protons cross each other, there's gonna be interactions we want the hard interactions, but often we will get these sort of glancing blows. Now, in the forward calorimeters, this is the sort of particles you'll detect more often, is these particles that sort of scatter off of each other, but don't quite, uh, they, they don't, the protons don't make a hard, what we call a hard scatter. Now, something I wanted to point out now is we were talking about how everything was lowered down. So if you take a look above me, this is our giant hole to the surface. And this is where we actually lowered the slices of the experiment. So it was assembled in our surface and the cavern of, in the, uh, it was assembled in our building above. And then with a big crane, we lowered it in slices before closing everything. Now, the reason we did this is there, there was a previously existing tunnel before the LHC. This was called LEP or the, um, which was an electron positron collider. Now, Atlas, LHCB, Elise, they had caverns because they had interaction points at LEP. So those already have been built, but CMS had not, it was brand new. 
So they had to dig out this entire uh, area that you see. And while they were doing that, they also needed to assemble the detector. So they have this large building upstairs. We assembled the detector as we were, as all of this was being dig, dug out and created very carefully. And then they began lowering it in slices once everything was deemed safe and well constructed and all of this, what you see here is finished. But so this is I'm, a long process. I, yeah, so if I may add just a bit of historical trivia. Uh, so you mentioned that there were lab experiments before at, uh, the, at what we call 0 0.1, 0 0.2, 0 0.7. There, there were actually several more. But uh, fun fact is that the, the, the magnet that is used nowadays for a lease is uh, basically recycled or reused from the pre previous detector, which was L3. And if you visit uh, LHCB, you can actually see part of the previous detector, which was Delphi. Yes, and it's really fun to go and visit LHCB. Uh, it's a very different experiment. So often we talk about CMS and Atlas because we are what we call general purpose detectors. We both try to uh, search for as much physics as we can. Uh, we try to make measurements of the standard model, search for new particles. But because we make the experiments as general as possible, that means some measurements we can't do quite as precise as an experiment that's prepared uh, in a different way. So LHCB and Elise, these experiments are very precisely made to measure different things. So LHCB is made to measure uh, um, hadrons that come that uh, contain bottom quarks. So these these are very specific measurements of the standard model that we are trying that they're trying to measure. Whereas Elise is often looking at heavy ion collisions. So this allowed them to design their detectors differently. They can't quite make all the measurements that we can, but they have a couple of measurements that they can make a bit more precisely than CMS or than Atlas. Uh, maybe I can very quickly add that uh, yeah, it's absolutely. Not, not to brag, right? But CMS is also very unique in that we can study heavy ion collisions with CMS, and we can also do a similar kind of physics that LHCB is doing, and that's also something unique about CMS. It, it is very, very general pur purpose. We also say that Atlas is general purpose, but they you know, don't have these other rich programs that we also have. Um, so I, I see that there's Q&A coming in. I'll just remind people that at any point they can use the Q&A to, to, to ask questions. And uh, typically we, we have somebody going through these. So please, please ask. Uh, and if, if uh, from outside there are questions that you would like us to address or anything that you'd like just to show, please just uh, let us know. Yeah. Actually, we got a good, good question. What do you mean that you try to make your experiments as general as possible? Yeah, so, so when, yeah, Brandon, you want to take this one? I'll let you take it, Andres. <laughs> so I'll, I can just say that uh, that's part of what I mean. Uh, so we, when we say general physics, we have many different research programs, right? So, and that means that we investigate certain, uh, let's say, areas of particle physics. Uh, you can say, well, there's flavor physics, for example, there's standard model physics, which is also part of that. Uh, so you can focus on very, very specific PKs of a specific particle uh, and do precision measurements, let's say. But there's also the heavy ion program. And by heavy ion program, I mean that uh, during a certain period of the year, often uh, at the end of the year, the LHC actually circulates lead ions. That means the nuclei of lead zoom around the LHC and we have them collide at CMS and at least specifically the detector, the entire at least detector is dedicated to heavy ion measurement and heavy ion studies. In CMS, we also have a rich program of heavy ion physics. Uh, and, and this is generally speaking, what we say is that it, there's just, we can study many, many different kinds of physics. In LHCB, as Brandon was saying, they do sort of flavor physics and they do uh, specifically look at, at, at B physics. Uh, which very, very briefly, B uh, physics refers to particles that contain the bottom quark or beauty quark, as they prefer to call it. And the, the thing with, the, with B quarks is that they live slightly longer than usual for a particle that, that mass. Uh, so they travel a, a small distance and then they decay. And we, we say that these are displaced vertices or uh, these are secondary vertices. Uh, so we can try to identify this and, and we can do this at 
uh, CMS as well, we call this B-tagging, where we try to identif identify displaced uh, decays, if you will. Uh, and there's much more to that. We, from there, we can jump to, uh, you know, that displaced vertices for in terms of like new physics. Uh, but I, I don't know if you want to add anything to that, Brennan. No, I think that was a great description. I just wanted to ask you guys, since we're, I, I walked back again by the open end cap by the muon system, and I was wondering if you had, if there were any specific questions that you can see in the Q&A about what we're actually looking at here, because I thought this could be a great chance to actually point out your answers to some questions. So there's one question that that is not necessarily something we can show, but there's a question of how do we keep things clean if there's dust, for example, and um, there is, this is delicate, right? But one of the things I can say that I learned from Sultan is that the entire airflow is very, uh, very carefully designed so that the airflow comes from outside of the experimental cavern into the experimental cavern and then into the LXC tunnel because you, you will generate dust, right? And this dust can be activated from the collisions. There is some radiation, um, but we want to keep all that uh, material in the, the mm -hmm. tunnel. I don't know if Sultan, you have more And, and also we try to, to, to stay as dust free as we can during operation that huge vertical shaft that Brandon just showed is closed uh, on the top. We, we do not allow uncontrolled airflow in. Uh, and, and also, uh, of course, the dust still makes a problem. So by time to time, we have to clean our equipment. We already had uh, uh, some, some campaigns on that. Uh, yes, this, is, this might be a problem. And yes, we, we have to deal with it, yeah. So I actually have a, I don't know how to, how to practically go about this, but I have a question for the audience. So here uh, you can see the, the barrel section. And my question is like, what particles would actually puncture or, or penetrate through the magnet, right? So there's a lot of particles. We look at, let's say the aftermath of the collisions, many types of particles are produced. What particles can punch through the magnet and actually make it to the other parts of the detector? And the answer is not many. Uh, I wonder if you guys know what, what particles those would be. Mm -hmm. uh, we've already while you're thinking, of, while you all are thinking of the question, to Andreas, or the answer to Andreas's question, I wanted to also go out and point out, uh, going back to this keeping things clean, these gaseous detectors like drift tubes, like gem detectors, like these cathode strip chambers. Actually, let's take a closer look at the cathode strip chambers. The gaseous volume is all sealed very, very, very carefully because we're dealing with a mixture. Of, of gases. So we deal with carbon. In this case, for the cathode strip chambers, we have argon, uh, carbon dioxide, and uh, CF4. And you can actually see the different cooling, the, you can see the pipes for the cooling, the pipes for the gaseous volume, and all of this is tightly sealed because we also don't want any dust getting into our detector volumes. This can cause uh, issues as well. But the gas system works differently in that it's much more controlled because it's, it's not exposed to the outside environment. Whereas what they're mentioning has a lot to do with detector electronics. Of course, we need to keep our electronics clean as well. And the electronics are more exposed. So you can actually see the, the cables. And if you, you can actually see the front end electronics. If we take a look, you see uh, the different lights that are turned on on the front end electronics of the CSCs. I don't know if maybe you can you can actually see some of the green lights. Mm -hmm. So in the moment, we're actually still operating our detectors, keeping everything ready, taking measurements of cosmic rays, or some of our detectors are taking cosmic measurements of cosmic rays. This is all for calibration. Uh, actually, even this far underground, we have the cosmic rays that come from the atmosphere still penetrating and coming through our experiments. And these are an incredibly useful tool to calibrate our detector. At the moment, because we have no magnetic field on, the cosmic rays will pass straight through and look like lines. So we'll be able to see them in the barrel region of the detector. But we'll see when we reconstruct the tracks, they just look like straight lines. Now, as we turn the magnetic field on, the cosmic rays, they produce muons, which still have charge. So when they enter into the magnetic field, you'll see these curved tracks that go through and we can start to calibrate very precisely uh, all of our detectors, align everything properly 
and be and get ready for proton collisions. Now, Andreas, did anyone answer your question? Well, uh, we did get an answer. Somebody mentioned neutrinos, and that's in exactly correct. So neutrinos go through everything like it's nothing. Uh, neutrinos, there's trillions of neutrinos going through your fingernails every second. Uh, so in CMS, I, I mentioned in the in the reply that we do not measure neutrinos uh, directly with the CMS detector. Um, there's another particle which we strongly hinted, right? So what it, you know, most of the particles that punch through ma the magnet are detected in the muon systems, right? The muon detectors. So the other particle that punches through, of course, is muons. I mentioned at the beginning that atmospheric muons, right, from cosmic rays punch through our detector all the time. So that's the other particle. Uh, since we were talking about neutrinos, there's a, a question about dark matter and how CMS is related to learning more about dark matter. And we could, and so in CMS, actually have many searches for dark matter under certain assumptions, but um, maybe it's, it's one way to try to talk about Andreas. missing energy. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, sorry for, sorry sorry for interrupting. Uh, uh, just, uh, I would uh, just refer to Janet's talk. Okay. She talked about the these uh, single X events where you have only one jet and you have a lot of missing uh, transverse energy or momentum. That's uh, that's the answer on that. So mm -hmm. there we are looking also for these kind of events where we have so much imbalance, uh, uh, so much missing energy that mm -hmm. might refer to this. But of course, this is always a, a not just observing something like this, but also trying to to observe what the the uh, right. theoreticians predict, and also we we try to to check by the models mm -hmm. and. So but it's, it is, of course, a, it's a very ch challenging part of uh, the research that we do, but that's indeed part of our program to search for dark matter. Brandon, you had, uh, yes. yeah, go ahead. So I wanted to say that now we, it's getting close to, to 7 p.m. our time, so I'll start making my way upstairs. But I wanted to give everyone one last chance to okay. take a look at our nice detector. So we have just a few nice camera angles. I always love looking at the nose. I was actually here testing all of the, the gem chambers before we installed them. So I remember sitting here with my computer, turning on chambers, checking to make sure that they were okay as we began to insert them into the experiment. And it makes me really happy to, to feel like I actually uh, put something inside of CMS. So I, I always love showing off the gem chambers as I'm sure oh. Andreas loves showing off uh, his detectors as well. <laughs> Indeed. So I wanted to now also we'll start add- going upstairs. Yeah. So uh, Brandon, so you you can if there's something else you want to show. I think we have a little bit more time, uh, oh, so okay. it is up to you. Uh, but I also wanted to point out something you mentioned earlier that in CMS, when you close all of the slices, it all fits together like puzzle pieces. Which is to say that there's not many gaps in our detector once it's fully sealed. It is uh, full of stuff, right? And when we don't have active detector components, then those are filled with cables or you know power supplies uh, and and all sorts of stuff. Uh, in contrast to Atlas, for example, which is such a giant detector, but there's gaps everywhere. And LHCB is even crazier. LHCB, you can barely tell where the, each part of the detector is. It's, it's just, you see the beam pipe and, and then some stuff around it, uh, but it's not, you know, we call this a four pi hermetic detector with CMS where uh, we really try to capture every single particle that's produced. So everything is very, very tightly fitting together once it's closed. I just would like to encourage the audience that uh, before Brian co uh, 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 comes up, I would uh, I would encourage to to ask him to go wherever you would like to. Actually, uh, I was thinking a nice thing to do would be the the Naomi and I are going to try to go to the top of the experiment now. So we're sure. just going to we're not going to walk on top of it, but just to show you what the top region of the disk looks like. What do you think? Well, the, what the, what I think is this is going to be a workout because this is about four <laughs> stories up, uh, and so it is much less than Atlas. Much, much less, than, less Atlas. than Atlas. That's, That's true. Atlas, Atlas is like six or seven stories. I don't recall exactly. Uh, as we, if we calculate in building levels, in their levels they have more than ten. Oh wow! That's that's uh, well, yeah, it's extremely tiring to go. Yeah. But they have an elevator. 
Oh, interesting. Yeah, so Brandon is going up and you can see the different uh, levels. Uh, in, in, in all of these levels, we can walk around the detector. Uh, and there are many services surrounding the detector, as you may have noticed. Uh, so they're traveling up to the upper level. And I, I'm not sure exactly what we'll be able to show you, but we even have part of the cryogenic system for the superconducting magnet up there. Um, so I think they're going to try to show it, it. Also, the view is very, very nice from up mm -hmm. there. So now it's a little bit more dark. I don't know if you can see me, but we're actually standing on the top part of the experiment, what we call X5. We label the different stories that we stand on. And actually, when I was doing a lot of my, my own detector work, like work we were in, installing our new chambers, we had to do cabling of fiber optic cables. These cables that allow us to send data outside of the experiment out to the cavern and then to the surface. And these are some of the racks that we're looking at. So now we have a good idea of turning on our lights. So I'll try to put my light out so that you can actually see what I'm looking at. Now, I always find this, this is one of my favorite places on the experiment to be. It's just, I, I, it's really cool to be on top you start to get a, a big idea, a really big picture of how the detector actually looks. And I think one of the, one of the things I started doing during my PhD, which I never expected was uh, I started doing a little bit of rock climbing. And I think that was really important because I ended up quite a lot of time on the, on the racks up here, right next to where you're looking down and yeah, you have a lot of safety equipment, but then you're just kind of looking down and it goes uh, all the way to the bottom and it's uh, almost, four stories up. So it was quite, uh, for me, it was uh, at first, it was like, okay, I'm glad I'm uh, doing the rock climbing. It's helping a lot with my <laughs> sense of heights. Um, so, uh, which is Brendan, it, since, yeah. you're, since you're showing this part of the detector, a couple of things that are interesting to point out is you can see this green structure we refer to be low, uh, below. Just, uh, so HF, uh, when we open up the detector, we have to, so this, this green scaffolding would will need to go up to the level of the beam pipe right now it's in the it's sitting on the floor because it was just previously inside of that garage so this is the hf garage and when we want to open up cms uh we this is too heavy to lift up to the surface so we just bring it out to the floor and then put it in the garage slide it away so we have room to move the slices and it's also maybe worth pointing out the uh the shielding so these this orange shielding you can see towards the uh towards the so there's towards the wall of the experiment, if you will. And you can see, hopefully appreciate that this thing folds around and seals the, the beam pipe around it. Mm -hmm. Back to you, Brendan. One, one more oh. thing I would like to mention just right here on the right, uh, this huge reservoir, uh, unfortunately, Noemi doesn't hear what I'm saying. So if uh, Brendan, could, could you just point her to the right? Uh, this is the... Yeah, this is the liquid helium reservoir of five uh, cubic meter uh, volume uh, thing that uh, that helps to cool down the magnet and keeps it cold. At this moment, it is empty. So this is completely harmless. <laughs> so uh, funny enough, if if this were full of liquid helium and, uh, you know, the, the superconducting magnet was cold and operational and with its 3.8 Tesla, I think we wouldn't be allowed in there, first of all. And second, the magnetic Yes, we field. are. Yes, okay. we are. But well, we have to, to, be we have to keep our uh, uh, respiratory pack ah. that Brandon just showed. Yeah. And, and furthermore, like the magnetic field is so strong that it interferes with the camera, with the out of focus. If you're wearing safety shoes, you can get them to be non-magnetic because you, you, the safety shoes are steel-toed. Uh, but if you happen to have steel-toed shoes that are magnetic, then it's a very fun adventure to walk around with the magnetic field on. And stick here and there. Yeah. Yeah. So <laughs> right now you see Brandon going just on top of the detector. Maybe uh, you want to say a few words? Uh, Brandon, okay, cool. I'm unmuted now. Test. Sorry. Can you hear me now? Yes, perfect. Excellent. Now so now we're actually standing on top of the experiments. And as I mentioned, this is one of these 
unique moment I, uh, where you can actually get a nice bird's eye view. Now, this is something we can never actually take visitors on. So this is the nice part of having this virtual visit today. So if we look over the edge here, you can see the nose where we were standing just a few minutes ago. And that is the sort of the bird's eye view. Uh, we install detectors in this circular pattern. So we always have to create these special, uh, what we call jigs, these special pieces to install the detectors in the circle around CMS. So we can take them on and off, fix them during a long shutdown if there had been some sort of problem during operations and then carefully reinstall them. Now, um, as you can actually look right in front of me, so now I want to just show quickly this sort of yellow bar that's across. This is one of our cranes that we have. These cranes can go back and forth and lift equipment for us and that we can use for installation in the cavern. Now, uh, let's see, how much weight can our crane handle? I, I believe like it's 20 tons. Yeah, so it, it certainly it certainly cannot lift one of the slices. No, of course not. Of yeah. course not. This so, is just yeah. smaller. It's just to to lift any smaller equipment, and sometimes that we we I've, I've uh, we've used these cranes to move uh, smaller detectors, for example, but it could be things like power supplies that are quite heavy and things like that. Uh, during installation of the gem and the detectors, Excellent. we help use the. Hey folks, so I just want to uh, come in a little bit. So. We're closing out on 12.15, so you guys okay. should start wrapping it up pretty soon. <laughs> Excellent. Well, we wanted to make the most of the time so you guys can see as much of the experiment as possible. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so in that case, we can start um, heading yeah, back up to the questions. Surface. Yeah. Yeah, so it's a good time for questions if there are any. Uh, and perhaps anything from the panel if they want to add any, any sure. comments. Can you hear me? No, it's just fantastic seeing this every every time. <laughs> this place is so big. I just want to say, since this is our last moment, uh, let's take one last view of CMS. Then Naomi and I are going to start heading upstairs. And I'll give the floor more over to you, Andreas, to talk about things as we begin to head up. Sure. OK. Thanks so much. Um... And there she is. <laughs> well, thank you all for accompanying us. And the two of us are gonna start walking upstairs. You'll see our camera. And if you have questions, I'll unmute. But for the moment, we start making our way over all the stairs. <laughs> so Someone there, there was a question. Yeah, yeah, there was a question about a big silver pipe. And this might be the cryogenic. If this is what you're referring to, that's the uh, cryogenic. I vessel. guess I guess this big silver pipe over there, that's, uh, that's the air condition. Of course, we have to we have to force the airflow, uh, as we just discussed, uh, and and obviously we have to make sure that we have an even airflow throughout the cavern. So there's a question about uh, the liquid helium to cool the supraglacian magnets. How do we create it? Uh, so this isn't. I, I guess we should point out that as far as I know, is LHC is the largest. Uh, consumer, I guess, of liquid. Yeah, but our helium. liquid helium is different from that liquid helium, mm -hmm. even if both are liquid helium. Uh, <clears throat> of course, here at CERN, so obviously you can't buy the liquid helium at this amount uh, in a liquid form. Uh, what we can do, we, we buy the gas and we cool it down and we liquefy it. Uh, there are several liquefier stations all around the LHC. And also CMS has its own. Uh, the reason why we don't use the LHC liquid helium is that we have different requirements on the on the the, the purity. Uh, that's why we have our own. Uh, if uh, Brandon and Noemi on the way back, if we would have uh, just time for that, if they could go could could pass by the the liquefier mm -hmm. in the service cover. So there's a quick question here about how how tall is the collider, which I interpret as how large is the detector. Um, if that's the question, how tall tall is CMS? It is 50 meters tall, uh, which is 45 to 50 feet, I guess. 15 times three. <laughs> yeah. Um, okay. And.
Yeah, that's the visit to platform again, and then they they leave the cavern now. Bye bye, CMS. I say Grace. I see Grace's face. <laughs> Yeah, I miss it so dearly. <laughs> well, Grace, is there, do you have any additional comments or anything we missed that you'd like to cover? No, no, I think you guys did a fantastic tour. Um, just when I've done it, I always like to point out the calorimeters, which also have a lot of new um, new materials for this run, but that's just me personally. But no, I think you guys did a fantastic job. There's a quick Zoltan, question about will, Oh, sorry. Yep, we'll try to make a uh, pass by the helium liquefiers uh, if we manage. <laughs> that would know. be great. That would be great. We'll it's on minus one, correct? Yes, yes. OK. So there's a quick question about visits. Uh, so CMS is currently available for, uh, available for visitors to come and, and check it out. Um, until I think early March. Well, this place uh, uh, well, where Brandon is 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 uh, uh, open for visits uh, throughout the year. Yeah, uh, that's very interesting. We are the only place at LHC where at least part of the underground cavern or the, the complex is uh, is open for visitors. Yeah, so um, you can year round check out the underground areas where the racks are but the access to the detector itself uh for visitors will be uh, i think open until around sometime in march yep uh and as yeah, i would say late march we may expect the first beams and what that 20 seconds 20 seconds so once that happens uh we we cannot have visitors and we, we have to seal the detector but uh, yeah if you're at cern you can try to get it to work Okay, so they, they are they are somewhere around very close to the very close to the helium liquefier. Yep. You still have access right, Naomi? So uh, I'm not sure if Naomi has access rights. I don't. If you have access rights, would you like the past uh, we had in the, the past we had? No, we don't have access rights at the moment. Okay. Okay, so, so that's if you just just uh, look over the the fences. Yes, that that yellow cylindrical object there. Uh, probably now we can find a better place to look at. And also, just to mention, a lot of the rocks we're walking by are even more computers, more control systems of electronics, of pumps, of the gas system of the magnets, and now you can actually see the, the liquefier that we've been talking about. Naomi's exactly. pointing That's at it over now. There. Yeah. That's something industrial item. Everybody can, can order it. <laughs> yeah. Well, well that, I mean, it's also... a little expensive to order for your home. <laughs> but that's that's kind of an interesting point is that at the LHC and in detectors like CMS, there are some things that we use that are sort of off the shelf, but there's a large, large number of uh, electronics and components that are custom made, custom built, custom designed. Uh, they have custom software, firmware. Uh, so there's a lot of uh, effort. It, it's I guess my point is that it's a one of a kind object that is carefully custom designed for its purpose. Yeah, so definitely what is concerning the detectors, it's state of the art, uh, and also what concerns the, the infrastructure where uh, the objectives are a little bit different. So let's say the, the, the operational safety, for example, there we, of course, uh, uh, rely on the industrial standard uh, equipment and and uh, and uh, uh, reliable equipment, yes. So yeah, now on the... we're making our way back upstairs. <laughs> on the left, that's the power supply of the magnet. Yeah, and there's a there's a, my favorite dial. It's not very visible, but there's a dial that uh, just goes to 18, but it's in kiloamps. So that's yeah. when the magnet is on, it goes to 18 kiloamps. Yeah. Actually, the, the stored energy when the magnet is energized, if I'm not completely wrong, something I remember, 2.2 gigajoule. 
I remember hearing that number and there was an, an uh, it, there was a figure of how much gold you would be able to melt with that much energy and it was quite a few tons I don't remember how much well actually I what remember I heard the, something like I the remember kinetic it. energy of the Boeing uh, 747 Oh, sorry. If I remember correctly, the it was the most at the time of when it was installed, it was the most energetic magnet in the world. But I, I could be wrong about that. <laughs> I think you are right. I think you are right. Now we're okay. going upstairs. We'll see if we lose connection. <laughs> nope, but probably on the way up you won't. On the way down, you surely will. That's the difference between the, the network providers. That's a little bit of a peculiarity. Uh, on the surface, we have the French uh, mobile network. Underground, we have the Swiss one. And the roaming in, in, uh, in the directions from Swiss to France and France to Swiss are not symmetric. So that's why we, we lose connection from France to Switzerland, and we don't from Switzerland to France. <laughs> It's kind of funny when you think about our network providers because this whole experiment is in France, but we have different uh, network providers depending on the location you are uh, within CERN itself and whether you're underground or above ground. So I always yeah, but this is only the 4G, the the Wi-Fi and the 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 other network is uh, is CERN. Ah, okay. <laughs> So now we're exiting through the system again. This time to leave, 